Demonized and suppressed by the war on drugs, psychedelic medicines are making their return. And we're here to bring you the latest in scientific research and therapeutic practices involving psychedelic medicines from psilocybin to ayahuasca to DMT and beyond. This is the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. I'm Dr. Lynn Marie Morsky, your guide on this journey, and today we are going to be talking about psychedelics and women's health with Dr. Allison Fiducia. Dr. Fiducia is a neuropharmacologist, psychedelic researcher, and a builder of virtual and in-person communities. She is the co-founder of Psychedelic.Support and Project New Day, and serves as a scientific advisor for Estra Health. In these roles, Dr. Fiducia facilitates the spreading of evidence-based knowledge, connection to resources, and strategies for individuals to maximize the potential therapeutic benefits of psychedelics through safe and responsible practices. She began researching MDMA in 2004 and has worked on studies of psychedelics and mental health conditions at universities, the NIH, and MAPS. Now, before we get to Dr. Fiducia, and by the way, I will say this in the episode and I'm going to say it again now, this may be just as useful for some of the gentlemen out there. If you are not a woman, please do not immediately turn off. We even have some information, Dr. Fiducia has some information for uh, trans women. So before we get to Dr. Fiducia, just a reminder that the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. Nothing here is to be construed as medical or legal advice. And just a reminder, as always, if you are a clinician and you want to learn more about psychedelics, please join the Psychedelic Medicine Association, where it is our mission to educate you on these very therapies. You can find us at psychedelicmedicineassociation.org. Now, without further ado. Thank you so much for joining us today, Allie. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about our conversation. There are so many places we can take this, but I'm going to start with a little disclaimer. If gentlemen, if you've made it this far, if you've made it past the title and you're still here, but you're wondering, should I stay here? I'm going to go ahead and just put a shameless plug in for yes, because we're going to be talking about things specific to women's health, but obviously women's health affects more than just women. Do you have a partner who is a woman? This is helpful information that you may want to know. Your daughter, roommates, I mean, people in your sphere whose health is important to you, I think this will this will be applicable. So stick around and hopefully learn some interesting things about this. Now, Ali, you and I were discussing before we started recording that unfortunately, this is an under-researched area. I mean, psychedelic research is in its nascency overall, but especially in women's health specific issues. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is speculation and building on what we do know about the research. But um, if we could you know, there's lots of areas we could take this with. People have lots of questions about, can it help with everything from PMS to postpartum depression to menopause? So let's start kind of at the beginning, um, uh, as far as in a woman's cycle. What is the thought about how psychedelics may be able to help somebody in with some premenstrual discomfort or PMDD? Yeah, so as you said, there's very little research, if any, that's been looking at these types of questions. But the idea of why there are pharmaceutical companies now looking at developing new compounds or or repurposing compounds that we know about to study women's health issues is because there is a lot of interaction between neurotransmitters in the brain, including serotonin which is uh, primarily responsible for a lot of the effects that we see with psychedelics, uh, that there could be like an interaction with hormone regulation in these neurotransmitter systems. So the idea that there could be modulation happening within the brain or throughout the body with the effects of psychedelics is really interesting. And then the other aspect is we know that psychedelics can shift moods and they're being studied rigorously right now for treating conditions like depression, anxiety, PTSD. So it may be that psychedelics could really affect women's moods as they go through these different life stages and help them feel better. So there's two kind of uh, different approaches there that we could start to dig in a little deeper in. 
to with the research studies. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if there's if there's something you would like to add on that that neurotransmitter side, because um, I think that's that's really interesting. I, uh, Dr. James Fadiman, when he was on, you know, he's done his citizen science and he interviewed ten thousand people microdosing. But one of the anecdotal uh, stories that he brought that was the most interesting to me was that he said a number of women were just microdosing like the five days prior to when their period would start. And I think you know this was primarily psilocybin and LSD, but um, aside from kind of that mood altering that we know it's it's uh, generally used for, um, anything that you have as as far as thoughts on how like on that other on that other neurologic level it may be helpful. Yeah. So you also bring up a good point about dosing. So there's microdoses, which is small sub sub perceptual. Uh, dosing paradigms. And then there's what we'd consider a full psychedelic dose where you're going to have large shifts of consciousness. So when we are talking about different mechanisms, we want to consider that type of uh, dosing and how much someone's going to be taking, how often. Uh, So the thinking uh, with, you know, if we think about microdosing, which as we know, a lot of times there's anecdotal reports out there. And I've talked to Dr. Fadiman too about women's health issues, which they found in their survey just kind of spontaneously. He was really surprised to read about these reports was exactly what you said, that women were doing different protocols, maybe different substances, even uh, microdosing and finding that they had uh, less severe cramps uh, around the time of menstruation They maybe had less heavy periods. They reported less headaches and just better mood. And, you know, how might that be? Again, it could be related to something happening in the brain. So sex hormones such as estrogen and progesterone work in the central nervous system. They can modulate um, and they interact with uh, receptors in the brain that can also be modulated by neurotransmitters including like GABA, serotonin, dopamine, glutamate. And so all of these uh, neuroendocrine and neurotransmitter systems can contribute um, to how someone feels and what's going on in the body. So that may be um, one explanation why someone may feel differently from microdosing around the time of menstruation. But the other possibility is that there's actually... Uh, a change in in the anatomy, or not a change, but there's a difference in blood flow to um, female areas in the body. So there's evidence that by simulating serotonin receptors in the uterus, that there can be an increase in blood flow. Um, So maybe there's some change at the level of uh, blood flow within, within areas where someone would be feeling um, pain or inflammation. Inflammation is also another area of research that's uh, been developing over the past, you know, I'd say five years, primarily with uh, Dr. Nichols at LSU Health Science Center. So it hasn't been looking at women's health issues, but there is observations in animal models and studies that they're doing showing that psychedelic compounds can reduce inflammation in tissues, in the body, and possibly in the brain. So that's uh, very fascinating when we think about the applications for uh, just, you know, reducing inflammation in the body and and how that could change uh, the symptoms that someone might feel around PMS. That makes a lot of sense. I think we always, well, those of us who were trained in medicine a while back, inflammation was not such a a discussed factor, but I think that's something to remember that in so many of the conditions that we discuss that are painful or uncomfortable in one way or another, there's very often an inflammatory component. And so thanks for reminding us that psychedelics very often can help with that inflammation. Um, Moving on from things that happen in the cycle, let's talk a little bit about what may happen. Well, well, let's go linearly here. Okay. So in a woman's life cycle, if she gets pregnant, uh, a lot have asked, are psychedelics safe to use in pregnancy? And I know we're using psychedelics as a giant class and the answer to one might not be the answer to the other, but can you talk a little bit about what may or may not be known about the use of these substances while a woman is pregnant? 
Yeah, so <clears throat> currently with clinical trials, pregnant women are excluded from the studies. And women that can conceive a child uh, must use birth control and agree to using birth control to be included in the studies. There's also pregnancy tests that are done right before the dosing session to assure that there's no risk of um, impacting a, a fetus during these administrations because there hasn't been enough data collected to really know how psychedelics could affect uh, developing, in, uh, developing fetus. Really, there's a lot of um, you know caution. There's there was some early research in the 50s that showed that LSD could have detrimental effects to a developing fetus. Um, you know, this early research wasn't um, you know so there's some indication there wasn't hasn't really been done it at a large scale or really controlled for it in super great ways. So I would say there's just not a lot of great information there. However, um, there are just general considerations, you know, when someone is pregnant, weighing the risks versus the benefit of taking anything and how that may impact the mother and, and the baby. So I would advise an abundance of cautious caution. And there's also the big risk of taking a Schedule One substance while you're pregnant or breastfeeding. We know that child welfare can intervene um, and children have been taken away from mothers that have used controlled substances that weren't prescribed to them. So that alone is, is a very significant risk to consider. Um, but with uh, prescribed substances like ketamine, uh, it's not typically, as far as I know, prescribed during pregnancy, but there are um, some research studies that have now looked at how much ketamine is in breast milk and what is the time course for the ketamine in, in any metabolite, metabolites to be um, cleared from breast milk. And so this is a really important type of research to do with any type of psychedelic substances to understand um, how long it stays in the body um, and when it would be safe to breastfeed a baby again. And it can be a little bit um, different when we think about breast milk because um, it's not just the same as what we know about metabolism and excretion in a normal sense of drug pharmacokinetics because of the uh, breast tissue in the in the amount of uh, fat in the tissue that, and even for substances to pass into that fluid, there's a lot of different factors to consider. So that has to be done through some different types of studies. Um, but for any compounds, as they make their way through FDA approval, how they start to understand if substances can impact uh, pregnancy or the developing fetus or um, young children that are breastfeeding is that they initially do studies in rodent models and in pregnant uh, rats to look at what the impact might be at different doses and different effects. Um, so that's where the research generally starts to get a sense of uh, what's the risk of, you know, trying it first in a small cohort of women and then from there, you know, building out. Um, to larger populations of people. Okay, that's good to know. I was going to ask how they, they do establish that. So thanks for clarifying that. And something you brought up going back to the trials, that if somebody signs up for a trial, they have to be put on birth control if they weren't previously. That seems like almost an independent factor, like an independent variable in these trials, right? Like Because birth control, we know, can have an effect on mental health one way or another, you know, it's, it, you know, people react so differently to birth control. So it's interesting that, that there are some people and cl clarify if I'm wrong, that start these studies and not only are they taking a psychedelic for maybe the first time, but they're also newly on birth control. Yeah. And to clarify that point, I believe it doesn't have to be a hormonal birth control. It could also be another type of contraceptive barrier, contraceptive if it goes that route, sometimes there's extra criteria that there has to be like two barrier methods. So they get very uh, specific with the types of criteria for 
for what they're asking participants to agree to. Interesting. These are things I had not thought about before. Okay. I like it. So we've covered premenstrual issues. We've covered pregnancy, breastfeeding. Let's talk about uh, an issue that luckily is gaining more attention, but still maybe not necessarily uh, that society has quite the understanding of the severity that can come with it, which is postpartum depression. Yeah. So this is an area that I've personally am really connected to. There was a really tragic story in my family history where my great grandmother back in the 1920s, she had just had her fourth child, my grandmother, and they lived in New Orleans at the time and her family was trying to support her. She was feeling really down and she had four young kids feeling really low and her husband brought her a really beautiful dress that was a period piece of the time, like very flowy and to cheer her up. And sadly that she took this dress and she wore it and took a boat out into the Mississippi River and drowned herself. And it was a really, really sad story to hear. And I didn't even hear it till many years after my grandmother had even passed, my mother shared the story with me. And it really affected me deeply because thinking about back in that time, how clearly that was postpartum depression, and no one called it that. No one really knew what to do. Her husband bought her a dress. It wasn't like take her to a doctor and get therapy or go online and find some resources for support. They just didn't really have a, a good understanding. Or maybe it was even stigmatized that, oh, you can't take care of your child. There's something wrong with you. And yeah. she really must have had no options or felt like she had no options. And to me, you know, this story really. Um, speaks to uh, the pressure that comes with having children, adjusting in a big phase of life. And when we think about mental health treatments and what might be helpful right now, we know that ketamine uh, can be used for helping people with depression. And there has been some initial studies looking at postpartum depression in women uh, that are showing some promising results there. And there's a neurobiological effect with ketamine for depression. There may also be other mechanisms of working with it with psychotherapy that could be paired with coping skills, more support, helping a new mother feel less alone. These are really novel paradigms. It's also short-lived, the effect ketamine, three, three days to two weeks perhaps is what most of the literature sh shows for depression. So that's also a, a big barrier for um, a new mother to have to continue to take treatments over and over again. So maybe benefit and limitations to this approach, which is why new, new areas of study with psychedelics are, are really necessary for this type of indication. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for sharing that story. That that really does highlight how this is not a, a small effect that this can have on mothers. This is a kind of a, an overwhelming effect it can have. And, and it does need to be investigated with these tools that we know are working so well for so many other indications. So right. let's, from there, let's talk about moving on in the female life cycle. Something that else that, that can happen is um, hypoarousal. Um, it's not it's it's not it's discussed probably the least of all the things we're talking about today, and I've forgotten there is a four letter. It's like hypoarousal sexual disorder or something. It's, forgive me that I have not googled this. It's HP something something. If you know it, please let me know. But what do you think about uh, psychedelics? I know that um, I believe Mind Cure is specifically investigating this, but uh, what are some of the thoughts behind how psychedelics may be able to address that? Yes. Yeah, so there's many different ways to think about low libido, not in the mood, um, maybe trauma that is affecting a relationship in the present that happened in the past. All of these types of effects can really um, come in and out of women's lives. You know, it might be a, a time sensitive, it might be more connected to a certain relationship, but there's very few treatments. I believe there's two approved medications for women that have um, hypo, 
function, hypo desire. Hypoactive <laughs> sexual desire disorder, HSDD, hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Thank you. <laughs> or anything like that. I mean, yeah. you don't even have to be diagnosed with a disorder, I think, right. to experience this <laughs> at times. Yeah. So thinking about, you know, the different reasons why this might come up, like perhaps there is a physiological effect that maybe there's low serotonin in, in the brain. Maybe someone's feeling depressed. Perhaps there has been trauma from uh, childhood or previous relationships that can really impact how someone is relating or feeling about sex. And sex does happen in the brain, our experience of it at least, is so much connected to what's going on with our thinking, cognition, and especially in women, they show that there's a lot of differences between men and women and what turns them on. This area of work is fascinating as we know that some compounds like MDMA, it's called the love drug. It's been researched already in a small couple study Previous to that, in the late 1970s and early 80s, that was the main use of MDMA in therapy was between couples to help them relate more, talk about their underlying struggles, think about how they may be able to improve their relationship and bonding together. But one step further from that is recreationally, people talk about this being a love drug and that it really can increase libido. Some also say that it can uh, have some negative side effects, that it might interfere with some of the, um, like might be a lot of passion, but some of the physical function during um, sex could be diminished. So that's an interesting anecdote of, of people talking about using this as part of their relationship uh, benefit, whether it's through talking or actually applying it within their sex life. So these are all areas that are really fascinating to think about. And, you know, would it be that it's a model, I believe Moncure is looking at MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for helping someone really look at, like, like what is really underlying this issue? Is it, is it a psychological um, construct that could be maybe better accessed with MDMA and, and better worked through through a therapeutic process? The other aspect is like, could you actually develop a substance that makes you more turned on? You know, like the Viagra for women. Right. <laughs> you know, um, so yeah, that's another idea that's being floated around of looking at possibilities of drug effects themselves or helping to use these drugs to work through psychological struggles. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, and thank you for clarifying on how many different angles that that sexual hypo arousal or lack of desire can come from. It could be trauma. It could be physiologic. There are so many different things. And so there may be different answers to those, you know, what is behind this? It's not going to be a one size fits all solution, even if it's a psychedelic solution. There may be different avenues. Right. Uh, and maybe a hormone related piece too. You know, as women age, we're going to have different changes and how much hor how many how much hormone levels are really circulating through the body maybe that is driving low desire as well so maybe there this concept of neurotransmitter modulation with our sex hormones may be a target for drug development work as well yeah that leads well into what my last question on the you know kind of time timeline was going to be was perimenopausal and postmenopausal um, issues that women may face at those times. How do we think psychedelics may be able to address some of those? Yeah. So it's a huge change in life. Thinking about your body changing in a major way, existential distress perhaps coming up, uh, real middle age type thinking. <laughs> happening. All of these to me really suggest it would be an ideal time to do higher dose sessions in the support of others that are going through a similar experience. Since we have more evidence really from the literature suggesting that the high dose sessions give, give a person greater insight, a better perspective of life, maybe feeling less that 
this is the end of life and a better perspective of, no, this is just a new phase in life and this can be a brand new time to do all kinds of things. That That's the kind of methods that are really described with quantum change and, and rapid change in someone's thinking or better accepting of their situation and less resistance to, to what's happening. In this case, nature is happening. There may be support from a therapist that would be really helpful for someone or support from other women going through this change of life together. There's also interesting ideas around MDMA regulates body temperature, so it can increase body temperature, which is also a risk of taking MDMA in hot environments where you might be getting a lot of physical activity, like dancing, is often when people have complications with MDMA, it's related to dehydration and overheating, and MDMA is raising the body temperature as well. But this is all to say that <clears throat> perhaps there's a modulation in the hypothalamus with body temperature of uh, drugs that target the serotonin system. And it's actually not known if it's norepinephrine or serotonin that's actually causing this effect in, of MDMA, but perhaps there could be new drugs discovered through this pathway that would allow for uh, better mitigation of hot flashes that are known to be a big symptom during um, menopause or approaching menopause. Oh, that will be very interesting and have a huge, a huge market as this is somebody that, you know, ev something every woman faces at some point, you know, some do or do not get pregnant. Some do or do not have premenstrual issues, but every woman, if they live that long, will go through this change and, and is affected in, in probably some way. So I think that's going to be a very interesting portion of research. Yeah. And I'll also add, this is also pertinent to transgender women who may be using hormones, if this type of modulation on mood or physiological symptoms, this could be really applicable too for helping to really have the body adjust and be more balanced to changes and in, in hormonal fluctuations in the body. Oh, thank you for adding that. That's, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's something I had not thought about as a use, but thank you. Um, there are some questions here that are some of my favorite in the realm. And again, you know, research is low, anecdotes are higher. Um, but I would love to discuss the effect that, and there's flip sides of this, but the first part, flip side of it is the effect that psychedelics can have on a women's cycle. I know, you know, many women out there, you might be thinking, oh, I've taken this certain psychedelic and then my period came at a strange time. So if you could talk a little bit about that phenomenon. Sure. I would say it's mostly anecdotal, but I have heard of women who have been, say, in an ayahuasca circle together. They talk about their cycle syncing up, maybe their period showing up early, earlier than expected or later than expected. I've heard both cases. So what does that suggest and what does that mean? I have no idea really what it could mean, but it kind of probably connects to this idea of maybe being um, direct effects of serotonin modulation in the uterus, so vasodilation or vi vasoconstriction, so there's more blood flow. We know that pheromones are re related to women's cycles seeking up. I've heard this more in the context of women living, living together, or working together. It takes more time months perhaps and then they're all of a sudden they're like okay we're all we're all synced up how interesting <laughs> and there is actual research around that what would cause this to happen rapidly say in a weekend perhaps there's a greater release of pheromones perhaps it's something that we don't understand from a scientific perspective of energies or uh, pheromones could be the, the energies in the room. I put quotes around that. <laughs> like, um, Everybody out but, there, she's, she's there quoting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, there are some interesting anthropological uh, topics that have been described by anthropologists about indigenous cultures who have used psychoactive plants in medicines like peyote and ayahuasca. Probably the most well-described or one of the best articles I've read was from Dr. Sarah Schaefer, 
And this was talking about her, her work in the Weechal Indians in observing their use with peyote. What she described was women would use peyote as part of their ceremonies and myths as their culture, but during pregnancy, different stages, and sometimes even to stimulate uh, contractions if they were having a difficult time in childbirth or maybe it was not happening, that they would actually use small doses of peyote to uh, invoke contractions. This talks to, this really speaks to the idea of indigenous knowledge that they came across through their own traditions that scientifically now it looks like perhaps there's the serotonin regulation in the uterus that would explain that application. They also talked about, Dr. Schaefer, um, if women's milk wasn't coming in, taking peyote would help that. And perhaps that's related to prolactin. So that's a hormone that will induce release of new milk production. All of this is fascinating that women in these different cultures have maybe known about these uses for thousands of years and why we as a Western medical approach to treating women's health with psychedelics potentially in the future for something like this, how we really got to consider where this information came from and how we can attribute and be mindful of reciprocity to these different traditions that probably informed our thinking around how this could uh, be applicable. But again, you know, much caution to, to just try this based on uh, what's been described in anthropology is much different than how a medical doctor like yourself would recommend certain uh, applications for women, especially around pregnancy and newborns. And we just want to make sure that we're following um, the good recommendations of doctors and science. I um, have also, you know, aware of some ayahuasca drinking traditions in the Amazon basin of Peru that have different um, taboos around women during their menstrual cycle actually sitting in ceremony. So they were not allowed to uh, participate during those times of the month, which I don't know enough about the tradition to really understand why they described it that way. But or had those types of requirements. But nonetheless, it just really speaks to how important women's cycles, women's aging, all these different traditions really considered uh, these stages of life in their ceremonial use of psychedelic plants and medicines. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. And what I love was that kind of the the retrospective of this is what they were doing. And now with what we know about physiology, perhaps this is why what they did was working. And mm -hmm. like you were talking about with the with the peyote. And so what I'm very interested to to know, and if somebody wants to write in on Instagram or the on the website and, and if you know this, but like if if like you were talking about the those in Peru who were forbidding drinking ayahuasca during it was there something that they knew was it that you know thousands of years you know if the first thousand years they were doing it while on the cycle and the outcomes were vastly different on the cycle than otherwise is that what led to that you know it'd be very interesting to see if there was some kind of medical basis for that decision just like there happened to be even though they wouldn't have known the physiology but there was a medical basis for why the peyote was helping contractions and was helping the milk letdown as well yeah, yeah, it would be fascinating to learn more about the cultural basis for these types of uh, rituals or parts of the rituals. I can't say about a totally different line of research that speaks to this idea of how drugs can affect someone differently depending on where they are in their menstrual or um, just in their cycle. And we know, you know, this is worth mentioning too that. During the month, there's different hormone levels that are fluctuating, going up and down, progesterone, estrogen, and progesterone, progesterone, sorry, <laughs> uh, spitting these words out. But that all of this is to say that there was a study done with women who were using cocaine, and they found that during uh, periods when estrogen is high in the body, that they found cocaine to be more rewarding. 
And this had an impact on the addiction profile of cocaine, essentially. So that's really interesting to think about that you might be more susceptible to finding a drug euphoric or perhaps the opposite, dysphoric, if you're in some place of this hormonal continuum. <laughs> yeah, that's such an interesting piece. And, you know, ladies out there, if you happen to track your cycles and perhaps you have some record of when you've had challenging ceremonies versus really euphoric ceremonies, it may be interesting to, to do a little uh, look back and see if there's any correlation there. Right, right. And some of you may have heard about uh, studies that were recently coming out about the COVID-19 vaccines that had an impact on women's menstrual cycles. What it showed was that on average, a, the cycle started a day to two, two days earlier than normal and lasted longer and flow was heavier. They speculated that this was part of the uh, antibody response, like a normal immune response in the body. Still preliminary about why that might be. Um, but all of this is fascinating to think about how drugs that maybe target something completely different in the body can impact a woman's cycle. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and, and vice versa. So f interesting things, you know, for those who are really into kind of tracking is, is see how your area of the cycle affects how the psychedelic feels. And then also was your cycle changed after the, the psychedelic and, and maybe it changes more with something that's seemingly like has a greater overall longer effect on the body, like an ibogaine or ayahuasca compared to ketamine. It'll be interesting to see how those have different effects. Yes. That's where medication development work really needs to go. I'm all about people sharing, having information and really individualizing their approach. So we have all these technology tools now, digital health, your wearables, your tech to track your cycles to the T so you know exactly uh, where you are. But to really do good drug development work, we're going to have to look at, you know, what are the hormone levels in the body? What is the effect of different doses? What is the effect of giving it at different time periods? There's such variability between women. It makes sense that it's not going to be the same prescription or this protocol. This is exactly what you do. It's going to be more about trial and error, really understanding your own body, which can change as we just talked about, like even introducing new drugs or, or different substances supplements, maybe you change your exercise routine or your diet, that could also impact what we're going to see with these different pharmaceuticals that may come out. So that's yeah. a, a good point to make of track it to know and adjust. And I would, I think that's a good approach for, um, you know, most of these types of um, anecdotal type reports coming out about psychedelics, because it, it works differently for everyone. Yeah. And, and the more we have reports on the anecdotal level, the more we know what to study. Like, it, mm -hmm. that, you know, that I, it's generally, I have had this experience and then 17,000 people others say they have this experience. Okay. Maybe we should look into this as, as an indication, right? That's why Johns Hopkins ran that study with psilocybin. And before them, they had run similar studies on CBD, gathering information from patients. And that's how they ended up finding, oh, my child's seizures do better. Okay, now we have some indications that we can study as far as, as seizures. And so the more you can track things and have anecdotal evidence, the, the more you can even just kind of contribute to the science in a way. Absolutely. That's what's wonderful about the technology today and surveys online, the ability to issue your own wearable data, health data to contribute to the knowledge, knowledge base. It's still not the same as controlled clinical research trials, which really can determine the difference between placebo effects and a, and a medicine uh, intervention. Nonetheless, it's providing tons and tons of information, which over time, to be honest, like could be more real world application data versus what's limited and controlled in trials. So our thinking in science is really starting to evolve with these new applications with technology.
and the ability to reach people in in their home and not have to go to the clinical trial site and take off work and all the kind of thing that tends to be a barrier. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, always uh, if, for those willing to contribute their data to the field of psychedelic science, there are all kinds of surveys out there. So, you know, follow Hopkins on social media and maps and there there's they will generally keep you abreast of ways that you can contribute to this. Um, Allie, this has been a fascinating discussion and I, I'm looking very much forward to having you on in like five years and when we talk about all the research that's been done in the meantime, hopefully to address some of these things that, that we've talked about. But in the meantime, can you please tell people about your work and where they can find you? Yeah, absolutely. Come to our website. The URL is psychedelic.support. There you can find a directory of licensed health professionals and community groups. We also do continuing medical education courses and free courses for the public. We hope to share all the information we're finding from research and what we're hearing from the public of what works and how to stay safe with different types of substances if individuals choose to engage with this. So do check out our resources there at psychedelic.support. I also work with a foundation called Project New Day, and this nonprofit is geared towards helping those with addiction disorders to use psychedelics in their path to recovery. So we're looking to help support treatments, peer-led recovery groups, and research studies. So thanks for, um, thanks for taking out those resources and let me know any feedback that you have on, on this talk or understandings around how we can support women, transgender women, and all those who are influenced by our cycles. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And for those of you out there who have not checked out psychedelic.support, let me just, this was one of the OG sites. Like even when I got into psychedelics, psychedelic.support was already there providing this amazing database. And I've just watched you guys add functionality and, and more things that can contribute to people's learning. And so it's absolutely a fantastic resource for anybody out there looking for more education or very importantly, integration therapists, which are such a key part of the psychedelic therapy process. So thank you for your work that you've spent years to put this fantastic resource together. Well, thank you so much for having me on and sharing the good work here. I appreciate it. Well, uh, like I said, we'll, we'll be checking back in when there's some more research to talk about. But until that time, uh, for everybody else, we will see you next episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please leave a rating or review as it helps others find the show. And if you'd like to learn more, you can find the show notes at plantmedicine.org forward slash podcast. And there's information for clinicians at psychedelicmedicineassociation.org. Our incredible music was by the one and only Porangi. We'll see you next time.